welcome to the Dribble Podcast, your home for basketball in WA, with an inside look at the Perth Wildcats, Perth Lynx, and WA basketball throughout the 2021-22 seasons. My name is Craig O'Donoghue from the West Australian Newspaper, and throughout the year, I'll be joined by a host of guests to provide you with as much insight and entertainment as your basketball brain can handle. In this week's episode, we'll be joined by Perth Wildcats General Manager of Basketball, Danny Mills, to answer the questions everyone wants to know about the state of the roster and what to expect from the team in the second half of the season. Plus, Perth Lynx superstar, dual WNBA champion and Australian Opals captain Sammy Whitcomb will take us inside the camp ahead of the club's first home game since January 2020. We're back in the recording studio this week after the COVID challenges of me having to isolate with my young fella last week after he was classified as a close contact at school. He was negative, but that experience has certainly told me that it's going to be hard on athletes to avoid having to become close contacts and isolate or avoid COVID uh, in the coming weeks. It's going to be a challenge for both of our teams. But it's an exciting week for WA basketball. The Perth Wildcats are currently in transit, heading home to see their families. The border is about to open up, and Perth Lynx are just days away from their first game since 2020, as I mentioned. Of course, the border opening had a sting in the tail when the stadium capacities were reduced to 50%. Another blow to sporting fans who have done the right thing, both in terms of vaccines and helping their teams out financially. So we hope that all of you listeners are able to get out and see some basketball at some point. Okay, so let's get stuck into speaking to our first guest. He is sitting at Adelaide Airport during a break between flights. He is the General Manager of Basketball Operations at the Perth Wildcats. Danny Mills, welcome back to the Dribble Podcast. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Appreciate you having me back on. Uh, you're on our first episode of, of the Dribble back on November 30, and you're in this studio. 27 days later, the team flew into state, and now you're almost home after what feels like an eternity away from WA. How is the group feeling? Yeah, I mean, definitely the group is um, very excited to be coming back home to to Perth and WA. It's um, yeah, it's been a long road trip. <laughs> Obviously, uh, uh, ten games and probably nine weeks, I think. And um, I think everyone after last night's win against uh, the Jack Jumpers in Hobart was just yeah. I think there was a little bit of weight lifted off people's shoulders, knowing that they'd be, be getting home and kind of seeing loved ones and wives and partners and kids. And so I think yeah, definitely excitement, but also knowing that there's still a you know half the season left. And a very important part of the season coming up with, you know, we've still got four more road games. And then obviously we've got the the nine um, at RAC to finish up the season and still trying to, you know, manage this. You know, now we're into level two COVID protocols in WA and how we manage that as a group. So you are following a really difficult itinerary, I reckon. You left Hobart this morning. It's about 20 past seven Perth time. And you're not getting home until 8 p.m. Um, 12 hours and 50 minutes in transit. You could have stayed one more night and got home tomorrow at about 10.35 in the morning, but it's clear everyone's prepared to do 13 hours to make sure they see their loved ones a day earlier. Yeah, yeah, we talked about it. And honestly, I, I, that flight wasn't an option Um just given it was already booked out. I think it was oversold by 70 people. So um, we ended up looking at other routes and, and this one just made sense. And um, yeah, it, it really was that. Everyone just wanted an extra day, honestly. And it's just been so long um, away from family and friends. So for us to for us to get back, whether it's even if it's just for 24 hours earlier than, than, than what we would have, just to see, you know, um, families at site. Uh, Definitely for guys, it, it definitely was worth the uh, the long travel day and three flights. So how do you reckon the team is placed at the moment? It's always hard when you're on the road and you don't really get, get the energy of a home crowd to know whether you're playing as well as you as you would like to be or whether the, op, the, the away crowd makes it hard in the away venues and the travel and stuff. How do you feel the team is placed? Yeah, I think when you when you step back and look at the first half of the season, what we've what we've gone through, I think you know we had a we had a good start. We were four and one, and and probably um, a bit unfortunate not to be five and zero oh with that double overtime loss against Adelaide, and and then we go on the road and we haven't been back since, and it was ten straight games. Um, we went five and five. So I think when you look at it, if you can take care of home court and then go about five hundred on the road, you're likely going to be a playoff team. Um, yeah, obviously we've had a bit of a hiccup with those three three losses, although they were tight games, and so I think. I think all in all, with all the disruptions, including the preseason, just getting the group together. You're also talking about. I think people do forget that we, you know we're, we're a completely new group, a new coaching staff, um, and so we're only 15 games in. It's it's it, and it's still a small sample size in the whole scheme of things. That you know, um, Scott and myself have come from a, a league where you play 82 games in a season, and so you start evaluating after about 40, 41, you know, and then you start evaluating the roster and, and how we've played. And you know, now we're 15 games into a season, and you're having to evaluate. So. 
um, all in all, extremely proud of the group. Um, resilient. Um, you know, they've battled through adversity, and um, yeah, I think we're I think we're well placed to uh, to kind of go into the second part of the season. And and you know, obviously our our um, our goal is always to to finish on top of the ladder, or at least the top two finish, and secure that that home court advantage in the playoffs. So everyone at the moment seems to be talking about the roster. It comes up in every press conference. It comes up during every game with the, the commentators as well. There was a lot of date during preseason about not signing the import centre, and you went for Michael Fraser at the time. And that when we spoke uh, the, when you were on uh, in the initial podcast, you said you could see a lot of chess matches sort of coming out in games in the future, where it would be your your smaller team versus other teams, bigger teams, and different ends of the court, and how it would be handled. Now that we're at the halfway point of the season, are you still confident that this mix of players is correct? Yeah, I think I think 100%. I think, um, you know, Scott and I have had a lot of talks about how we want to construct our roster in, in terms of how he, he views the game and sees the game and wants to play it. And um, we definitely came in with a roster that we thought was really versatile across the, across the board and um, had all positions covered. And yeah, I think going forward, um, I would say... As, as every team should be. I mean, you're always monitoring the market. You're always evaluating your own team. And if opportunities come across that you can improve the roster, then that's always something that you'll look to do. Now, the, given the NBL and there's just not many levers to improve a team once the season started, there's no trade period. Uh, and it's hard to bring in um, players during the season. But um, if there's ever ever any opportunity, then that's something we'll always be evaluating. Um, you know, we're looking at you know potentially going into a playoff series against some of these top teams in Melbourne, Southeast Sydney, Illawarra. Um, you know, looking at those matchups and where you can take advantage of um, our matchups against them, we'll continue to evaluate um, going forward. So everyone's talking about Michael Frazier at the moment. It's obvious, even just looking at his face during games, he knows he's being talked about. Um, when he had that eight second backcourt violation last night, he looked like a bloke who was just thinking, "What? What?" Where's my life sort of going at the moment? This is just isn't working. I feel like I'm in the gun was the way it sort of looked like on his face. So what have you told him about all of the speculation around him and, and what would be at the moment his fears? Yeah, I mean, Mike's a, Mike's a professional, first and foremost. I mean, he's been in these situations. He's played in a Final Four with Florida. Um, he's played professionally in Italy. He's played, obviously, in the G League and in the NBA. And, and he understands that, um, you know, he's probably not performing up to his standards or our standards, and, and he knows that. Um, and he, he's trying to work through that, and we're doing everything we can to help him. You know, it's, it's difficult as well. Like, he's come into a, a foreign country, into a COVID situation where we're out of Perth um, for, for, for 10 games, and... Um, yeah, he's he's working through that, and I, th- I think it's just a, a phase. And I think he's he's going to work his way out of it and to perform. And we have complete confidence in in Mike, and and so does the whole staff and playing group does. And you know, he's he's handling it as professionally as he can. It's it's not easy, like you said. There's a lot of media speculation out there, and that's fine. You know, people people have the right to have their own opinion on it. And um, yeah, we'll just continue to evaluate going forward and uh, and go from there. But but Mike's been handling it as as well as he could. So it sounds like you got a bit more confidence in him than what the. Uh, lo- a lot of the, the commentators watching the games and calling the games at the moment are. So w- would you say you're more likely or less likely to make a, a roster change um, b- between now and the end when, you're, uh, when you have to, which is in about a month's time, if you, if you were to make a change? Oh, like I said, I don't think it's either here nor there. I think it's something where we've, we've always evaluated the roster throughout the whole season. And if there's opportunities to, in, to improve it or ways that we can strengthen it in different areas, then, then, then we'll try and do that. And so I couldn't give you a, a yes or a no. I just think as as the season goes on, obviously there's a there's a time period um, that you can't continue to add players. Uh, you have to play seven games, qualify for finals. So um, there is a time period on it. But yeah, like I said, we're we're always keeping an eye on the market. Um, but yeah, as of right now. Um, Michael Fraser is a Perth Wildcat, and and, and we're going to help him get get through this kind of funk he's in, and 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 get, getting back to kind of the flashes we've seen in past games. So, how good is he when he's at his best? Tell because people haven't seen that from him at the moment, obviously, with injuries and and all those, and confidence and things. When he's up and going, what does he bring? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've seen that in, in spurts. Um, it's obviously been a bit inconsistent, but um, yeah, I think Michael first and foremost is a uh, is a shooter, an off ball shooter, and that's kind of why we brought him in to help space the floor for Bryce. And so obviously, you know, Bryce and Vic formed that chemistry pretty early. Um, you know, you, you you watch the teams now aggressively blitz Bryce out of pick and roll, and he's having and he's that's one of the best things about him is he's so willing to get the ball out of his hands and, and get it moving. So then you're still playing in advantage situations, and um, you know, Vic's able to to play make himself and then for Mike it's it's something where he needs to you know be able to knock down threes and that's what he's done his whole career and they're just not falling at the moment and that's part of the game you know and you know he's he's been a career close to 40% three-point shooter and we haven't seen 
out yet, which obviously is, is part of why he's probably underperformed to date and why people might be disappointed in him, fans and the media. But we know what he can do. Um, at practice, he's been fantastic. Um, he's putting, it's not like he's not putting in the work. He's, he's one of the hardest working guys we have on the team. And so that combined with his physicality defensively and just a different type of look he gives us on that end with when you combine him and Mitch Norton in the backcourt, uh, we feel like we've got an advantage there, um, on the defensive end. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, the hope is that shots start to fall and the confidence comes back and, and, and that's what we believe in with Mike. There's one really interesting element of this team that I reckon that every time you play, you're playing against the same type of opposition, taller and you work your way through it. But when those teams come to finals, they're not going to be as, as accustomed to playing against a smaller team like yourselves and will have to adjust on the fly a little bit more. Do you think that's an advantage that you'll have practiced the exact same way all the way through the season and, and, and combated these different taller opponents, but they won't have had that practice if they play against you. They'll have only had you the four, three or four times once they get to the playoffs, if that occurs? Yeah, um, I think so. I, I think in a way, like, yeah, Scott's very consistent in um, in how he in how he views the game and, and plays the game on the offensive end. Um, and then obviously defensively, we're, we're a team that uh, wants to be versatile and, and switch. And um, yeah, I think for us... Um, we do like going probably a little bit smaller, but I think you look at other teams in the league. I mean, Sydney, Sydney's a small squad. Um, you know, th- then you come up against South East and Melbourne and obviously they've got probably bigger lineups than us and even Illawarra. But the other thing is we can go a little bit bigger and, you know, we do have a six eleven big man. That's, you know, the last two games has really shown his form in Matt Hodgson. So we're excited about where his um, season's headed. I think he's finally finding some consistency in terms of, you know, he, he had a lot of disruptions, came in late, um, you know, had the, had the injury early, had a, <laughs> had his first child, got COVID, um, got suspended. So for him, it's been up and down. And so, you know, we, we were really excited about what he did the last two games against Southeast and Tassie. And we, we hope that form can continue. And, um, you know, and then you continue to look at all the all the other guys that, you know, Todd's had a disrupted season with, with uh, injury, but he's starting to find some form. I thought Luke Travis um, was fantastic last night. And we've seen that from, you know, in every second game. And now we need it every game from Luke. So these are these are some exciting things I think we're starting to see is that, you know, although we're halfway through the season, it's really been a small sample size where we've had our full roster even last night within that Mitch Norton. So I think once we get healthy and everyone's on the same page, I think we're, we're going to really um, have a have a strong finish to the season and, and you know you don't want to be peaking now you want to be peaking for us it'll be early late April into into May that's when we want to be playing our best basketball you mentioned last night this is a good opportune time to go to our dribble podcast MVP votes from the last two games so against South East Melbourne we went one vote to Bryce Cotton for his 15 points in the second half two votes to Matt Hodgson for countering the Phoenix on the glass in a big way and three votes to Vic Law for his 22 points and nine rebounds and against Tasmania it was one vote to Luke Travers 16 points and five rebounds in a dynamic display. Two votes to Bryce Cotton for his 20 points and five assists and three votes to Vic Law for coming away with, from that ankle injury with 19 points and 13 rebounds. You've got some injury issues at the moment, as you said. You, you haven't, you've only had your team on the floor twice for the entire season. Let's go through some of that, those issues at the moment. How is Mitch Norton with his concussion? Yeah, Mitch is fine. He's totally fine. He's obviously a trooper and obviously if, if, uh, if it was up to him, he would have played yesterday. But... um. Josh Kavanagh and Dan Webster, our medical team here, do a fantastic job of looking after the guys' uh, health and safety first and foremost. And that was obviously part of our COVID protocols. Uh, Sorry, not COVID, um, concussion protocols. And he was ruled out of last night's game. Um, So he's he's fine and he'll be be ready for Adelaide. So so with with Mitch, I was surprised that the NBL didn't announce any type of investigation into the incident due to the fact that it was concussion and it wasn't the eye injury that we initially thought. And Mitch Creek also hit Bryce Cotton in the face accidentally in the same game. Did you consider asking the league to look into it? Do you know if they looked into it? Um, they didn't look into it. I think um, from what we understand, a, a melee or a brawl has to um, take place after something like that for them to formally investigate it themselves. Um, teams can put a formal complaint in. Um, we've looked at film as a staff and, I mean, Mitch Creek played made a play on the ball with his left hand. The right hand probably came back a little harder than what you would hope. But in all essence, I mean, yeah, disappointing that it took Mitch out for the end of that game more, most importantly, because that, I think we could have definitely used his um, his ability to play on the ball in those final minutes against Southeast. And then obviously, um, you know, he missed, missed, missed the game last night. But in generality, uh, I mean, you can put a complaint in, but I don't really know what that's going to do, to be honest. I don't think he would have been suspended from it. So for us, it was just play on. 
um, focus on what we can control, which was go into Hobart and um, and get a win, and that's what we did. So for us, that's that's in the background, and I'm sure Mitch will use that as motivation going forward. How is Matt Hodgson's calf after last night? Yeah, he's fine. He's fine. Totally fine. Uh, just a little little knock there, I think. Yeah, he's fine. He'll be he'll be fine going forward. Um, you know, just a general um, aches and pains that we get from from all of the from all the games and practices these, these guys are in at the moment. But you know, once again, we've got a fantastic medical team and Dan Webster and Josh uh, Kavanaugh that take care of the guys extremely well. And so, yeah, we should be um, ready for for Adelaide come Sunday. And Bryce, just in general, with that thumb, obviously it's been strapped for years. Um, after he hurt himself a while back, I think it was in New Zealand where he initially slammed his hand in, into a backboard. He's, he's landed on a few times and been hit pretty hard a couple of times. Has he got any issues with that thumb going forward? Um, I guess judging by his performance last night, it doesn't look like it. Like he's uh, he's unbelievable, isn't he? Just the way you can put points on the board really quickly. Um, and obviously, yeah, it's it's noticeable that he it does bother him a little bit, but um, it's not enough for him to distract him from from playing at all and um yeah bryce is one of the most resilient players i've I've seen i mean he gets he gets held and and bumped and pushed all over the court and he just keeps keeps getting up and keeps making plays so um for us it's definitely not an issue at the moment are you responsible for the bryce cotton citizenship portfolio at the wildcats (laughs) No. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. It's not, it doesn't not on your desk. You, it's, it's shuffled across to Basketball Australia or to the, 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 the immigration minister, or whoever, whoever needs to get it done. Yeah, exactly. We're waiting on that from them. Again, this stuff's uh, way above my pay grade in terms of that being in with the uh, with the government. And you know, again, like I've come into this role and I've um, got to cross that. And obviously, that's something that's that's in the works and will be fantastic when it happens. But yeah, not something that we can click our fingers and it's just going to come. So. Hopefully, it's soon, sooner rather than later, for sure. Um, but for us, again, we're just focused on the roster we have and what we, you know, the, the levers we have to build a roster. And that's, you know, at the moment, that's with Bryce being as an American. So, as we said, we've, we're 15 games in. So we've, we've hit the midpoint way of the season. You've only had your entire squad available twice, and you won both th- those games. So, when you look forward and start projecting, what does that tell you? Did, did you look and go, if we get everyone back on court and actually fit – and with nine home games, we're going to have a massive crack at this at the end of the year. Is that the way you are approaching things? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's amazing. And, and that comes with the pressure of the, the position and, and, and the club. Like, you lose two to three games in a row at Perth and the walls are caving in. And then you step back, you're like, hold on, you know, we're, we're nine and six. We've played the last 10 on the road straight. And like you said, we're going to be coming home with nine games in hand to play in front of a, a crowd at RAC, hopefully at bigger than 50%. Um, and so, yeah, for us, I think we're, you know, we're, we're confident with where we are. Um, we love the, the resilience the guys have shown. We think there's going to be vast improvement going forward. Um, you know, keeping everyone healthy is, is going to be massive and that's for every roster. And that's, you know, that's just the, um, that's just sport in general. You know, you have to get some luck with it as well. But um, with, with where we're playing, you know, it's not like we've gotten blown out by these teams we lost. They were all tight games and, you know, we probably didn't execute as well as we would have liked down the stretch. But those are all learning experiences as well. And you take them and, and you, you, you learn from them. And, and Scott and his staff are doing a fantastic job of reviewing each game and making sure guys understand that the next time we get in those situations, these are the things we want, want to execute. And so I'm um, extremely happy with where the squad is right now. Um, and yeah, just excited, honestly, to, to get home to Perth, be around family. I think that's going to really help guys. Um, just mentally, I think it's been draining the last two, three weeks knowing we were coming home, uh, the excitement of it, but still being on the road. And so hopefully getting home for a few days now will give everyone a bit of a uh, refresher. And then, um, you know, we're really excited to, to get back to Adelaide and, you know, they, they, um, they gave us a bit of a lesson last time we played there. So I think the guys are really excited to, to get back on the court and, and kind of play a play against them. Now, as you recall from last time we spoke, we have a segment on here called This or That. Can't sit on the fence, got to go one side or the other. And it's a bit easier than probably the last one we asked you. This one is all about March. And March Madness is about to start in college basketball in a couple of weeks' time. We don't have any similar sort of tournament in Australia at the moment, but we know NBL 1 were hoping to get it off the ground eventually. Do you see that as being something that will be a big, big thing in Australian basketball? Um, in terms of like the NCAA tournament coming up? Yeah, if, if they're able to get all the NBL 1 teams, they'll be like NBL 1 West and East and South and all those sorts of teams together for, for a March Madness sort of a tournament, it'd be in, it'd be in June more than, more, more than March, but is that something that will be a, that would become big in Australia, do you think? 
<laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting concept. Um, I think it could. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, like a yeah, obviously a knockout phase. I mean, I think it's a um, that's a fantastic model. It's exciting, right? It's it's one and done, and you got to win six in a row at least in, in the NCAA tournament with the the, uh, the sixty four teams there. Um, yeah, I think it that would be fantastic if you could get at the end of the season get all teams and they're seeded to a um, some specific location and you play a tournament like that based on seeding and it's and it's knockout one and one and done. I think that would be really cool, actually. Yep. It's something that would, I reckon would be very fun for everyone involved. It would be pretty cool. And it's, it's been great talking to you today. It's been great to have your availability for this podcast. It's been great to see how the Wildcats have gone throughout the season while they've been over there. Not many hours now until you're back in Perth, one day of quarantine and then back out into the real world. So thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. I know it's been difficult with the travel today. So thank you for coming on to the Dribble Podcast. No worries, Craig. Appreciate all your support from the West. Thank you. And now it's time to enter the lair with this lady. To Brianna, Whitcomb at the buzzer for three, there it is! Bobby Whitcomb! Here, Whitcomb freed in the corner! Left in regulation, driving baseline, kick it back, who left Sammy Whitcomb open? Yes, she's a Perth Link star, she's a global superstar, and I want that bloke following me around and commentating on my life. Sammy Whitcomb, welcome to the Dribble Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. That was a bit of a walk down memory lane. <laughs> What's it like having him call your games for so long? Like, when you do good stuff, it's good to have a good commentator, and he was epic. Yeah, he was the best. He would get so, I mean, he would get more excited than anybody else, I think. And I think, especially um, for me, because he knew my story and he, um, you know, he was uh, a fan, I think, of just kind of how I got there. He was always a little bit extra excited for me if I made a shot. <laughs> and you certainly made a few shots that day. That was in the. Second year or first year on on the storm? That was my first year, first year, my first game that I actually did like got got on the court, so that was fun. <laughs> and six threes and a half. It was a it was a fair effort. It's fair to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we're only just, there's a lot of excitement around now with Lynx fans. We're only just a few short days away from a really historic moment for the club. First home game since January 19, 2020. Your first home game at Bendat since January 5, 2018. What's the feeling yeah. like amongst the group? Yeah, look, I think um, a lot of excitement, definitely just relief, I think, to be back as well and know that uh, we'll actually be able to have some home games because there was um, obviously a period where there was a bit of doubt with that once the reopening of the borders was delayed, um, sort of without kind of a, a timeline. So I think... We're really excited. Obviously, we're really proud of kind of um, the effort and the um, what we were able to do in Ballarat being away for so long. And I think now we just really are, are keen to play some home games and hopefully with some fans there. What's it like for you? Because you left the Lynx as a bit of a Cinderella story of someone who's gone from SBL to WNBL to Lynx MVP and captain and then the WNBA contract. And you're returning yeah. as a two-time WNBA champion, World Cup civil, silver medalist and Australian captain. You're a vastly different person to what you were when you left from a basketball perspective. Is it emotional returning to that court? Um, it's exciting. You know, I think just it's... It's where I feel like I got going kind of in my career and where I think a lot of my opportunities um, have come from, you know, playing well um, for the Lynx, you know, really served me well in terms of creating those opportunities. So I think it's really nice that I do get this chance to come back and uh, put that jersey on again and play on that court again for those fans. And hopefully, you know, like you said, hopefully I have (laughs) come a long way and I have developed as a person and a player um, through those experiences. And yeah, it's just nice. I think I'm really keen to get to play with some new Lynx players, some old ones that I'm familiar with too, but definitely a really a uh, cool moment for me to get to be on that court again. So for Lynx fans, Saturday night's game is against Sydney Uni Flames. It's a 7 p.m. tip-off, which is 10 p.m. in the Eastern States. Then there's two games early next week on Monday and Wednesday against Adelaide, which are 6.30 p.m. starts. Pretty late for, with a 7.30 p.m. the week after against Canberra. Like the, the later starts for you guys, is that a big advantage, do you think, given a lot of these players you're playing against will be getting ready for bed? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, you know, we... Um, I think, you know, we kind of got used to playing, obviously, the later time slots over there. And it was 
a little bit different at first because it was earlier for us. So you get you get used to playing really, I think, at any kind of time of day um, in any time zone. I think most basketball players are probably pretty adept to to the fluctuating time zones and, and times. But hopefully that can, you know, give us a little bit of an advantage. We'll take that. Um, you take any advantage playing home, obviously, and that's kind of what we're really excited about. If that turns out to be one of them, then that's great. I mentioned your last game in Perth back in that 2018 final series, which was probably the most emotionally distraught I've ever seen any sport team during a game like you, you dominated the season and finished on top then got ripped off by a schedule that included seven flights in eight <laughs> days and three away matches before a cutthroat home final which was lovely of the WNBL at the time seeing that yeah. group crying on the floor in the last 30 seconds was savage from the sidelines and there's a few of you still around with yourself and Alex Chibatoni and Ryan Petrick now is coaching was an assistant yeah. coach assistant coach Nat Burton is part was part of that team also being back mm. on top of the ladder is it unfinished business with yourself and that group of players? Oh, I'm sure there is. I think, you know, it is such, for the most part, though, such a different group. And I think, um, you know, we have our own expectations, I think, with this group and our own um, just goals that we want to accomplish. So I think certainly, like, I, I still remember that. And that's still very, uh, like, raw and real for me. I, I remember the expectations we had. I remember feeling gypped at the time going into it. Like, I can't believe this is the schedule. And kind of thinking, you know, you suck it up. You have to just deal with what, you know, the hands are dealt. But I remember when, you know, when that final siren was going off, just being so devastated that we weren't able to to pull it off because we felt like we, we should have. So I think, um, you know, I'll bring in a little bit of that for sure in terms of wanting to, um, to get a little bit of, you know, redemption or whatever it is. But I think for the most part, you know, we'll come in as our own group with our own expectations um, for ourselves and our own motivation to to get it done, whatever the schedule looks like. So the problem that year was the schedule and flights. The problem this year is that the borders are opening and COVID numbers are going up just as you guys get to come back yeah. and play here. As I said, March 5, 7, 9, 12, 16, 18 and 20 is your schedule, which means if anyone gets a positive case, they're, they're going to be isolated for probably three games. Are you yeah. really conscious of doing nothing outside of n- the normal life to avoid potentially contracting COVID and being sidelined for that amount of time? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone is a little bit for sure. It's if for that reason, for just not wanting to obviously have to do any additional isolation because we've done so much of that as it is, you know, there's a number of factors that kind of go into us wanting to to be really, um, really smart, really safe, um, you know, over the top maybe with some of those precautions and stuff because, yeah, you'd hate to, you know, you get this far and then potentially you get it right when finals start, you could miss all of it or you could miss, you know, a really significant part of it. And that's, you know, that, that, that hurts the person. It hurts the team for sure. So I think we're mindful of all those things, but it's, it's hard because now you're, you're back around family, you're back around friends, people have their jobs, people have partners that have jobs. So, you know, you you do have to still kind of live, but you definitely, I think we're all very, very mindful of, you know, this next uh, three weeks, whatever it is, um, you know, we might need to just be a little bit smarter, a little bit more safe to really put the team's um, goals and, you know, all of that first. You're very good at quarantining and avoiding people, uh, I reckon, over the past couple of years. This is what I've got written down as the times you've quarantined for an extended period. You returned from France in 2020, that's 14 days. You head to the yeah. US, you had to quarantine before you left, then you had to quarantine when you got there and enter a bubble, so yeah. that was another 14 yeah. or 15 days. You leave the bubble, come home for the birth of Nash, two weeks in Sydney Hotel, two weeks at home, there's 28 more. Yeah. You've had the Opals camp last January when you are in Brisbane and an outbreak yeah. happened, which meant you had to come back and quarantine again. <laughs> then you got yeah. back from the Asia Cup, hotel quarantine, and yeah. now you've, then you returned from the World Cup qualifiers, more quarantine. You must have, I reckon, 90-odd days of quarantine. How have you survived yeah. it? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's before counting. And, you know, I'm very lucky that what it was in France, but I was in France for at least a month where we were under quarantine rules. We weren't allowed to play basketball anymore. The season was delayed. We weren't allowed to train. There were really strict rules there as well where we could only leave to go to the grocery store. So I was in quarantine by myself for like a month because Kate had um, already come back to France as well. So I very much count those days because even if you're in, quote unquote, a home or your home, it's just really really hard to be isolated from people. And when you're in a different country, that stinks as well. So look, I've done my fair share. It's really difficult. It's not ideal. 
for so many reasons. Um, and it's not something, you know, that I would wish on anybody. I hope that I've done my last one. I've said that multiple times up till now where I've thought, yeah, this will be my last one. But look, you just get through it. It's one of those things that, you know, looking back, it, it all feels sort of like a blur and I can't really remember how awful it was. But I do know at the time it was awful. <laughs> and I, I really do hope that I never have to kind of do that again. So let's talk a little bit about yourself and the way you've changed as an athlete since you last played over here. I'll look back and say that you are this dominant three-point player when you were in Perth initially. Nearly half your points came from three-pointers. Then you went to Seattle and it was, that rose to above half. And even at, mm. Liberty, at Liberty last season, it was 65% of your points came from th- the three-point range. But right now you're on about 42% at the links and you're showing a, a, a real drive to the basket at every opportunity, which is something you built clearly throughout your WNBA time. Do you feel you're a different beast from a, a scoring point of view now where you can go any way you want, whatever the, the, the defenders give you, you can take? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I've always tried to become and tried to be. Obviously, sometimes, you know, the way people defend you changes and the way teams defend you, the way your team offensively is structured and is playing. Sometimes, you know, those threes open up a bit more for you. Sometimes the lane is what sort of is a bit more available to you. So I think sometimes you have to just take what is given. Um, And I do think that more and more, the older I've gotten and the more experience I've gotten, I just think I've been able to read that probably a bit better. And I've been able to not force a three when actually the drive is there, or I've, you know, been a little bit better at reading that like, okay, actually, even though most teams run me off the line, like the shots, what's available and not the drive. So I think, you know, I've, I'm just trying to develop a little bit more poise in my decision-making over the course of the last few years. And obviously I think the best place to do that. Um, in terms of facing the, you know, the toughest defenses and being able to practice that is the WNBA. So hopefully, you know, my time there has served me well in regards to that. And I think that's probably why, with the exception of probably as well, is my shooting just hasn't been fantastic in WNBL this year. So I, I have just relied more on my um, penetration. But Hopefully it is a case of, like you said, I'm just, um, I've developed a little bit, hopefully. And the one thing that is consistent with everything you've ever done, especially since you got to Australia, is success. Like, it's it, fo- it followed you from SBL through to WNBL, even though you got ripped off in um, that, that second year. You played in the grand final, 2015-16, uh, um, then you win the two championships at the Storm, you won a silver medal, you've won the, the, the Asia Cup success that you recently had. Like, other than talent, what's the key to a successful team? Because you are, have been a part of a lot of different teams and they've all been successful so there's got to be something that you do as part of that to help a group and but but you also notice culturally what helps your group yeah I mean I think for sure I can speak to that with you know the success we had in Seattle it was a hundred percent the leadership you know we had we had obviously one of the if not the best team I would say in terms of um, individual talent collective talent but I think you know that there's truth to that saying that talent can only take you so far I mean you have to be you have to be willing to work hard. And I think a lot of that comes from good leadership. Um, if your stars are are giving their all and working their hardest and um, setting that tone and demanding that of everybody else, then that really trickles down to everybody else. Um, and we had that in Seattle and it's what um, I'm hoping to try and continue to um, you know, to bring to New York. We have so many players like that in New York already and it's something that um, you know, hopefully I can I can just help develop as well and be that kind of a player there. But yeah, you talk about culture, that's that's a really big part of it. I think leadership is so massive and um, it's one thing to be great, but if you don't have um, the right people, I think leading and, and helping those players to, to be great and, you know, helping them when maybe when they're when they're not as great, um, keeping them positive and stuff. I think those things go a really long way for a team. So do you see that the, all the culture, all the talent, all of the, the selflessness that's required to, to win? Do you see it in this Lynx team at the moment? Yeah, I do. I mean, look, we've got Jackie Young and Marina um, and they're incredible talents. Like they're really, really amazing players. And I think, you know, you could you can tell in my opinion that as much as you know they are capable and probably you know interested in scoring and being good individually they want to win they want to win more than they want those things so i think that's been really really important to this group in terms of um all of us trying to figure out okay well how do we do that what's our role 
And sometimes it might mean taking a backseat in ways that, you know, you're not maybe used to doing or stepping up in ways you're not used to doing. We might need people to do more in these areas and less in these or less in these and more, whatever it is. But it's figuring out, okay, how do we all work together? What's What are the pieces that we all individually need to bring to make this thing fit? So the regular listeners to the Dribble will know we have the Dribble Podcast MVP Award and Marina Mabry has been leading that. And obviously we haven't had games for the past couple of weeks. So just a latest update is, as it's been for the past month, Marina Mabry is leading on 15 votes, followed by Lauren Scherf on 13. And with the number of games coming up, there will be a truckload of votes by the time we release the next version of the Dribble Podcast. Yeah, since getting back from Melbourne, oh, from, oh, from Ballarat, more to the point, it must be nice to have spent some time with Nash again. Yeah, that's been really great. Um, having to be in Ballarat for an extended amount of time and then obviously going to Serbia as well uh, following that. But um, yeah, it's been really great to be back, to get to spend some quality time together. Uh, have a little bit of an extended stay in Perth with some home games, hopefully have maybe a home final. Um, and just, yeah, I think just being back together, it's it's time, you know, you don't get that back. So um, we want to just make the most of what we have now. He is the most travelled one-year-old going around at the moment, isn't it? He's, uh, he's seen a lot of the world. Yeah, he really has. He came with us, obviously, to the States. He's been with us to Turkey when we went there. Obviously, been kind of all over Australia, so he's pretty well traveled. And honestly, he's he's such a good little traveler, so it makes it pretty easy for us. When you look at it, at the world at the moment, you've played in several countries and you've gone all around around the world from the US to Germany, as you said, France, Turkey. You see, when you see what's happening in Ukraine right now, does that make you reconsider where you might, what you might do in the future and how easily life can change, um, mm. and maybe focus on America and Australia? for safety reasons as you go forward from here? I mean, I think you always take those kinds of things into consideration. Um, you know, what the quality of life will be uh, when you play somewhere, when you go somewhere. Because obviously, yeah, you're going to live there and not you're not just playing basketball. It's You want to have a life there as well outside of that, especially if, you know, your partner and your child's going to be with you. So those are always considerations, I think, for us. Um, so, yeah, it'll be something maybe even more now that we have to look at just with, um, you know, the new Ukraine Russian stuff, which, which is just it's it's sad. It's terrifying. It's I think it's scary no matter where you are in the world, but particularly if you are in those areas or close to those areas. So for sure, we'll be thinking about those things and making sure that whatever we decide to do as a family, we're doing it in what we feel like is, you know, hopefully the safest environment. We saw former Lynx import Ariel Atkins announce today that she was safe after being in the Ukraine playing, and you've got some really close friends who are playing in Russia at the moment. Brianna Stewart, who is arguably the best player in the world and was part of your storm dominance, was over there. How are all your friends? Have you been able to make sure that they're okay while they're over in that part of the world at the moment? Yeah, actually, Stewie's not in Russia um, at the moment. She hadn't yet gone back to ECAT to play this year, so um, she yeah, she's safe and in the States. And, um, you know, Natasha Howard's uh, plays for Dynamo Kursk, so she's been in Russia. And I think it sounds like the ones that I know are are safe and are, for the most part, planning actually to, to leave to come back to the States just to, you know, avoid kind of um, any potential for not being safe, really. It's a pretty awkward week at the moment, I reckon, for, for basketball in this country with the World Cup draw being conducted um, for Sydney on Thursday and Russia have qualified. Um, at the moment, as an Australian captain and somebody so involved with it, are you comfortable with the draw taking place with Russia being in it at the moment? Oh, I mean, look, not really, quite honestly. Um, but that's something that hopefully... Uh, you know, FIBA and everyone will look at and address. And I can't imagine that they um, do anything, hopefully, that is going to, you know, negatively impact the safety, um, you know, of a tournament of all the other teams and stuff. So uh, hopefully that's something that can be addressed. But obviously right now there's just, there's such greater and more important things that are happening to the actual people, you know, in Ukraine. And so I think that that probably deserves, you know, more people's attention um, than, you know, uh, our draw at the moment. But yeah, no, it's it's something that will definitely be, as it gets closer, a concerning thing. It's also like, well, I look at all the promotional photos and, and you're front and centre in every single one of them. You, you're um, in the qualifier photos that the league FIBA put out with all of the promotional material. You were there with Brianna Stewart and then in the rankings that were recently put out your right front and center as well flexing like Hulk Hogan and then the the, the one with all the, the teams that have qualified there's you right again in the center and there's a Russian player right behind you like you're, being the face of it is that hard for you when you see those sorts of pictures and wonder is this right for me at the moment 
Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to, uh, I haven't really thought too much about, you know, the promotional side of it and the the photos and all of that. I, I don't always see them. But yeah, like I said, I think I'm just, I'm really, um, I'm really empathetic to the to the Ukrainian people and to the people who are there right now. Like I said, it's really sad. It's really scary um, knowing that, you know, I know people that are impacted by this right now and there's so many that are over there and it's just, it's something that I hope is we're able to kind of get through and that we're able to, um, I don't know, prevent from turning into like World War Three, really, because that's, that's kind of the, the heights that this could get to and it's scary to even imagine that. So I'm less kind of, you know, thinking of it in terms of how it impacts me or, um, you know, the basketball that we have to play upcoming and hope that it's just something that can be dealt with for the, for the people of Ukraine. Have you thought yet about what it would be like to captain this country in this country in a World Cup? I haven't. I've I've still just really am trying to grasp the fact that I, you know, was named captain um, in Serbia. That was really such an incredible honor and a really special moment and not one that I saw coming. And um, it was, yeah, it was really, really special for me. And particularly with that group, you know, that group was uh, has some incredible leaders in it, some really phenomenal vets um, of the Opals. And it's just, it was, yeah, it was really special. So it's something I'm still, I'm still, um, you know, just really taking in and um, embracing and um, grateful for. Uh, I have not, you know, imagined yet like what that could be because, you know, you just, I, I don't know that that's going to be what it is and it would be incredible as well. But I'm also just really trying to focus on being, um, the best teammate and player I can be to make that world roster and to um, and to help us be as great as we can be. There has been something that struck me since you've been the captain. That's been the change of number from 32 to 4. That General Hay obviously wore 4, but it hasn't been a traditional captain's number. Was it? Was that the reason you wore 4? Is that becoming a new thing within the Opals? No, I, I was given that number. I picked 32 um, for Worlds, and then I assumed I would just get 32 there on after um, at Asia Cup. I don't know if it was because they just had already ordered uniforms. I, I'm not really sure, but I was given four at Asia Cup. Um, and then I was just given four again here. So I, yeah, I have no idea. I would love to wear 32. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, that one, I don't actually know. It's given you a bit of luck along the way, 32, hasn't it? It's been a fair number. Uh, yeah, it's been all right. It's been all right. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have a segment here on the Dribble Podcast called This or That, where we just focus on one issue and you've got to jump on one side of the fence or the other. And the question sure. this week is, we're now into March, and that means that overseas it's March Madness in college basketball, mm. not far away. We haven't seen it really tried in Australia, even though we've thought about it over many years. Now that NBL 1 West is going so well and other NBL 1 competition is going well, do you think it would? it is a concept that will take off in Australia, yes or no? Uh, yes. Uh, did you play in it? Sorry, what? Did I plan or did, did, did I plan did you, it? No, did you, did you, did you have much success my, in the, from, from March my Madness? first year um, under the June and Mike Doherty, we made it. Um, and then they they weren't my coaches for my final three years and we never made it back. Um, but it's I, I love it. I watch I every year. It's I still get so much excitement from it. And it was really thrilling, even though it was brief, my experience um, in it. And I know it is just... I don't know. There, it is magic. Like there's something about March and those games, and where anything, any team can upset anybody, and miracle shots happen pretty regularly, and comebacks happen, and upsets happen, and it's just something about it that um, is really, really exciting and intoxicating. And I hope that it's something that can be maybe recreated here in a different league, so that people can really kind of appreciate, yeah, that feeling. Certainly an exciting time overseas for people who love that. And it's an exciting time in Australia and WA for Lynx fans. So as we said, Perth Lynx versus Sydney Uni Flames on Saturday night. Sammy Wickham is back at the lair at Bendat Basketball Stadium with her teammates. And hopefully there is plenty of success. Sammy, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Well, that's it for the Drill Podcast for this week. Remember, keep logging on to thewest.com.au for all your basketball news and pick up your copy of The West Australian. Thanks to Samantha Rogers, as always, for her production work. Thank you to Danny Mills and and Sammy Whitcomb for their time. We'll be back next week for another episode of the Dribble Podcast. Woo!